and be a part of what God is doing. If you have your Bible today, turn over to the book of Matthew, chapter number 21. Thank you again, Fonda, and our singers today. We're going to have a great time with our choir next weekend. Please come and be a part of that. Naturally, you would have me to go to Palm Sunday reading today. I could not escape the fact that I could not ignore that. I originally had another thought on my mind, and I'm going to carry it over to the night. And I thought it really wouldn't be fitting today unless I had actually uh, addressed this particular topic today. The title of the message today is simply this, When the King Comes to Town. Has he come to your town? Do you know him today? I remember years ago, I think the last name was Locklear or something like that, the, the man that done the reading. I know G.E. Patterson actually uh, done a rendering of it as well. And he, he said, that's my king. Anybody remember that? Maybe I'll do that again for you one day. I'm glad he's my king today, amen? Well, when Jesus came to town in this setting, as we begin to read this in verse number 1, we can find it meant different things to different people. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem... And were come to Bethanage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying, Go unto them, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, a young donkey, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, straightway he will send them. And as, he was, as, as this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye, the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, a colt, the foal of an ass. Verse 6. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set him their own. And a, and, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strove them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Would you stretch your hand this way and pray for me this morning? Father, we do come before you today. As humble God as I know how, Father, to ask of you today for the unction from the Holy Spirit above that God that you would touch us that God that you would help us today to hear from you that we might be able to share the word of God just exactly the way that you would want me to share it today I pray father God for that anointing God that breaks every yoke that destroys every bondage I pray today God that we would see Jesus as we have never seen him before I pray, O oh God, even now that you would touch our minds, our hearts, and open up the eyes of our understanding that God in everything that we're going to be careful to give you the glory, the praise, and the honor for it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen, amen, and amen. When we look at verse number nine, verse number eight, excuse me, and a great and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strode them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When we look at the triumphal, triumphant entry into Jerusalem, as you and I know, looking at it through at the cross, we know that it was a time that Jesus entered in, willingly Jesus did that, knowing that by the end of the week 
that Jesus would face the cross. When we begin to look at Jesus there as he entered in, as we look at the Gospels together, we can see the different events that took place that week and how that this triumphant entry was a very significant event because we as Christians today understand that it was the way to the cross. When Jesus entered in, he rode up on a borrowed donkey. When Jesus went to the a cross, and he also borrowed a tomb, simply because he did not, because he knew that he would not need them very long. You and I know that when we look at Easter, when we look at the resurrection, when we look at what we'll talk about maybe a little bit next week, that when the angel of the Lord was there at the tomb that day, as Fonda so graciously done the song this morning, and the angel looked in, and the Bible said, Why well, seek ye the living among the dead? For he is not here, uh, but he is risen, as he said. But in this particular event, Jesus had sent his disciples in front of him. Come there, and Jesus would come into the city of Jerusalem. When you begin to look at these particular events in chronological happenings of this, first of all, we see that where that Jesus came there, they begin to take their cloaks, they begin to take their, 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 their clothing, if you will, and put them on the street. I heard one preacher say that the reason that they did there is because they honored him, uh, and they honored him as royalty. And we look at it that Jesus was looked at through our eyes, looking back at him so holy, if you will, that even the very place that the donkey's feet uh, would, would hit the, the street, if you will, or strike the street, if you will, was a place of holiness unto the Lord. Uh, as Jesus entered in there that day, the, 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 the streets rung forth uh, with a hosanna and a hosanna. Again, when we look at this, you and I know that that Hosanna just simply means uh, save us, or that Hosanna just simply means uh, save us or help us. Now, let me just kind of veer away from my outline just a second. I know it's early for me to do that, but I tell you, friend, if there's anything that we need to be saying in today's uh, society and in today's world, uh, it is a Hosanna, 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 because you and I know, uh, except God help us today, you and I know today that there is no hope uh, within us. There's no hope for us. Uh, as the writer said that our hope is in the Lord. Our help is in the Lord. But we see today that Jesus' purpose for riding into Jerusalem was simply this. It was a time in Jesus' life when that finally it was a time for his public presentation. It was a time for him to be publicly known and to claim, be claimed as the Messiah. And the king of Israel would come in as again we see here in Zechariah how that the prophecy was in Zechariah 9 and verse number 9 of how that again the writer here Matthew actually quoted this uh, in verse number 5 if you will. But this says, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold the king cometh uh, unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt uh, the foal of an ass. It was there that prophecy came true as Jesus Jesus rides into this capital city as a conquering king. As Jesus rode into that city, watch this, the people began to hail him. They, they began by the people. He began to be the praise and the homage uh, went forth uh, as, as, as if they were saying, uh, here he comes, uh, here comes our king. Uh, and the streets of the city of Jerusalem at that time was filled with a, with a wonder a wondrous, amazing excitement that was there because the king had come and the one that they had waited for had came. But yet, my friend, when we begin to look at the scripture today, you know and I know 
even though the streets was there and the streets was one that was filled with uh, an excitement, if you will, it was only a few days later. You see, the people there at that time uh, understood that Jesus was coming uh, as a conquering king to overthrow Rome. Uh, but yet he reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 50, he says in the word of God that his kingdom is spirit and his kingdom is life. Another writer said that his kingdom is not meat and drink but life. Uh, we understand that it is spirit. Uh, Jesus was not coming to overthrow Rome. Uh, Jesus was not coming at that time uh, uh, to, to, to set up his, uh, uh, his kingdom on the earth uh, but he was coming there at that time for the people to be prepared uh, for what was ahead of them uh, and that was salvation. Uh, it was that Jesus came uh, and offered them hope that they had never had before. I'm so glad to know today that you and I, we have that hope today. Hallelujah, hallelujah forevermore. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. The thing that really got my mind again is if you read the different writers throughout the New Testament and the four Gospels, if you will, even though when the people looked at Jesus and they thought that Jesus was coming there to overthrow Rome and the people were saying, Hosanna, they wanted nothing more than to be delivered from the tyranny and from the power of Rome. But when they understood that Jesus' kingdom was not meat and drink, when they begin to understand that Jesus' kingdom was life and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What happened then? It's the same thing happening today. If people today, you tell them about Jesus and you tell them about the good news of the gospel, and, and it's not everything that they might be thinking in their mind or what their expectations is. It happened even way back then because you can read there in Luke 23 and 21. You don't need to turn there. But what did the, what did the Bible say? It was there when Barabbas was chosen and they were going to let loose one of the malefactors, if you will, as the custom of the day. And they looked at one of the most hardened criminals of that day. Barabbas, you know him. He was there. He was a murderer. He, he, he was one that had, had done much wrong and sin. And when they found out that Jesus was not going to deliver them, that Hosanna simply turned into the crowd crying, what shall we do with this Jesus? What shall we do with him. What was the word that went forth from the crowd that day? You can, you know it. Crucify him. Crucify him. And then all of a sudden, the streets where the joy was there, and I'm getting ahead of myself, away ahead of myself, but we can see there that all that joy became a, a, a time where that their mind looked to his crucifixion. But let me reel it back in for a minute. Who is this Jesus? When we see him, we see it prophesied again in the book of Psalm chapter 24. We see where the Bible is, we're reminded there in Psalm 24, the very word of God, as we look in verse number 7. I love these scriptures, and I've said them many, many times over, of how that in this particular verse of scripture, how that the, the, Bible, the Bible actually says it like this. He said, lift up your heads, O ye gates. He says, lift up, O be ye lifted up, you everlasting door." I like that, don't you? Lift up your heads, uh, O ye gates. And then he said, lift up these everlasting doors, uh, and then the King of glory shall come in. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this. If you and I will get our attention focused back upon him, and we open up the gateway to our heart, we open up the gateway to our life, we open up the everlasting doors, the spiritual part of who we are, we we give him an invitation as he said in Revelation behold I stand at the door and knock you give him an invitation I don't care who you are today oh my friend if you give him the invitation to come in I'm telling you what friend he said he will come in and he will sup with you and you and him can come and dine amen I'm so thankful of that today lift up these gates these everlasting gates and as you do, the Bible says uh, that the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Bible said the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Verse 9 says these words, uh, lift up your heads, uh, O ye gates, lift them up, uh, you everlasting doors. <coughs> 
and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Uh, he is the king of glory. Oh, my friend, today, even though, they, even though they cried Hosanna in that day, you and I, as we cry Hosanna unto him today, my friend, he will come in and he will change your life for all eternity. But we think about Jesus and we think about the time in Jesus' life. Even though we look at it, looking through the lens of the cross, we look at it through the lens of the gospel, we have the written word. But you know, there was a time when Jesus was dealing with different people throughout the scripture. Whether it was a blind man, whether it was different individuals throughout the scripture. I'm not going to turn to all of these. I'm actually going to turn maybe to one or two of them. There was a time in the scripture that Jesus mentioned this and I'm just going to go to Matthew 12. I'll turn there real quick. Matthew chapter number 12, because it's really close to me. We're already in the book of Matthew, so we'll just turn back a few pages. When you look in verse number 15, it says these words. And this is Jesus again. He says, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him. And he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known. Interesting that they should not make him known. Isn't it amazing when Jesus came into the town, they began to cry, Hosanna. They knew that their king had come to town. They knew that Jesus had come to town. But yet many times throughout the scripture, it was said of Jesus, don't go tell anybody yet. And it was a time that he was not to be made known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the Bible says this, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he, and, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flag shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in this his name shall the Gentiles trust. It was not yet time for Jesus to be revealed. Every time, and there's several different places throughout the gospel where Jesus would heal somebody. And Jesus would say, go and tell no one. Don't tell anybody what had taken place. But when Jesus came to town that day, it was a time for the trumpet to be sounded, for the shofar, if you will, to be blown. It was a time of celebration that the king has come. My friend, if there's anything that you and I, my friend, need to do today, we need to lift up our voice. We need to lift up our voice like a trumpet and let the world know our king reigns and our king rules and our king is alive even more today than evermore. Hallelujah to his name so what did they do there that day Jesus again as he opened up the scripture again it was a time where Jesus came riding into town into Jerusalem he would spend the whole week there that week it was a time where that they would put the palm leaves on the ground it was a time when they would do that and it was a time that they would begin to Spread their cloaks on the ground. I tell you something, friend, there's something we've lost in the church today. And it is, the, it is showing God the respect that is due His name. It is showing Jesus Christ that we still love Him. See, commentary said that when they did that, when they took their coats and they spread them along the way, that it was a way and a method in that day of showing uh, royalty and showing respect to the Lord, showing royalty to those that was in a royal position. The time had come again when Jesus, Jesus openly declared to the people that he was their king, that he was their Messiah. A long awaited time, a time that they had been waiting on is when Jesus had come. But yet when we look at this today, like many in our world today, unfortunately, the praise of the people, if you will, the lavish that they lavished upon Jesus again was not because they recognized him as the Savior from their sin. As I've already mentioned, I told you I got ahead of myself a little bit. But it was they welcomed him out of their desire for a messianic deliverer. You know, there's a difference. 
There's a difference. And I'm off my outline again. There's a difference. Let me get down here among you. There's a difference between being saved because you love Jesus and being saved, and I use that word very loosely, just because you want to escape hell. If Chris was up there, I'd get him to give me a drum roll. Did you hear what I said? There's a difference between loving Jesus, Brother Beckner, because he's the Savior, your Savior. He changed your life. You want to love him and you want to praise him because he, you know him as your Lord. You know him as your Redeemer. And, and you just can't get enough of Jesus. You know what I mean? Somebody says, you're just a fanatic. Thank you very much for the compliment. But people say, you're just too overwhelmed with this Jesus stuff. I said, thank you very much for your compliment. And see, I don't use, quote, unquote, my religion as a crutch. One preacher said, hey, if I'm using my religion as a crutch, give me two of them so I can lean back on it, you know. But we don't love him today just because we want to escape hell. I wish that would sink in. I don't want to go to hell. Come on, somebody. But I didn't come to church today because I didn't want to go to hell. You listening? I come to church today because, yes, out of obedience, yes, it's the first day of the week, the, the, the Lord's Day. We come to assemble ourselves together. But I come, Brother Steve, because I love him. I love him because I, I want to be around him. I want to be around the fellowship of the saints. But more than that, I want to be where Jesus is. See, the people were okay. They were okay with Jesus being there. As long as they got what they thought they were going to get out of him, but as soon as they found out that he was not going to leave, that he was not going to deliver them from the tyranny of Rome, all of a sudden the whole situation changed. Sort of like I'll live for Jesus until there's no demand made of my of my life. I'll live for Jesus as long as I don't have to live right and spit white and you know, sorry, and, and do the right things. I'll, I'll, I'll live for Jesus as long as I can have Jesus in my sin too. I'll live for Jesus as long as I still get my way. My friend, I'm going to tell you something. It is an absolute total surrender to him when Jesus comes in your life. Here's the great thing about it. When you totally surrender your life unto him, it's not drudgery. It's not demand. It's not hard. It's not even hard shift. You love him because he first loved you. And you just can't get enough of him. Come on, church. You want to be in his presence. You love him. But yet there were many that day who, though they did not believe in Christ as Savior, nevertheless, they hoped that perhaps, perhaps that he would be a great temporal deliverer. And they held him with hosannas that day. They held him as king that day. They held him as king and say it, son of David that day. And, and the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But yet in their expectations, there was a massive revolt against him. And again, I'm going to go back to this and say it again. I can come to church. I can sit on a pew. I can go through the process. As long as there's nothing required of me. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. God don't want just a little bit of you, a half of you, a three-quarter of you. When you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, guess what? He wants all of you. He wants all of you. And see, again, when we look at this, Jesus, again, he refused to lead them in a massive revolt against Rome. The, the occupiers of the crowd quickly turned on him. You know this as well as me. Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them, in the middle of the 12, his name was Judas Iscariot. Even though Judas was there, Jesus did not deter from his mission of... Uh, Jesus did not deter from his mission of being who God wanted him to be. So in a short few days, the hosannas that they heard in the streets of Jerusalem quickly turned to crucify him. Again, in my own mind, I think about this. How would it be today? What are we saying today? Are we saying, oh me? Are we saying, oh, it's that Jesus crowd again? 
Or are we, are we like the crowd that day? Lord, I'll serve you until I don't get from you what I want from you. But yet they quick, as quickly as they held him as a hero, they soon rejected him and abandoned him. I don't know why I keep hitting that so hard. It's because it is so easy. Now don't get mad at the preacher. It's so easy to walk away. Are you with me today? When, when, when the prodigal son lost sight of his father's house, he quickly went back out into the hog pen of the world. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. I don't know of one thing that I left behind me. I, don't, I can't think of not one thing that I left behind me that I would ever have to go back and get again. Are you with me today? Heartache, sorrow, and everything that goes along with it. I, I don't have to go back and get one thing. And I'm so thankful today of who Jesus is. And the people, as soon as they discovered that Jesus' kingdom, as I've already stated, was not a kingdom of flesh and blood, they turned on him. The story of the, triumph, the triumphant entry again is one of contrast of those uh, of the certain contained applications for us today. In other words, we look at Jesus again. We think about Jesus coming into town. We think about Jesus coming into town riding on a little donkey. Again, looking at it from symbolic symbolism or symbolically, what did that mean? Again, even though the Bible said that Jesus again came and Jesus said, My peace I give unto you. The donkey was a symbol of his humility. He didn't come to war with them at that time. He come, fulfilled the prophecy, but he didn't come riding on a grand stallion at that time. But my friend, when I begin to think about this, we can see where Jesus humbled himself. Again, he didn't come in royal purple robes at that time, but he was clothed among the poor and he humbled himself. If you go into Philippians chapter number 2, you know the scripture as well as I do. Philippians chapter number 2, we can actually read it there. And we can see what Jesus actually said in the word of the Lord. And this picks up in verse number uh, 6, if you will. And it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. The word was made flesh, and it dwelt among us. Verse number 8 says, and, and being found in fashion as man. Watch this. He humbled himself. Listen, no man took his life. We, we heard the song and we hear it said, the nails that was in his wrist, the nails that was in his feet, is not what held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for you. It was his love for me. It was his love for the world that kept him there on the cross. We know the scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He humbled himself even to the death of the cross. But we see here again, and became obedient. The Bible said he became obedient unto death. I remember reading, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I was reading earlier how that Jesus was there on the cross. And maybe this is next week's message, I don't know, but I was, I, I was reading where Jesus was there and they put him on the cross. And Jesus cried with a voice and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Again, which has been interpreted and he was saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? I can tell you why. For a Steve and for a Dallas and Brother Kane, Brother Robert, Brother Hardin, that's why all the way around this room and all the way around the world because he was not willing that any should perish but everybody come to repentance. Let me hurry along. Again, when you look at this word again, we see this in the scripture in the book of Philippians chapter number 2. We see this there in verse number 8. It says he can become obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now God has exalted him. Jesus humbled himself, but God exalted him and gave him a name that's above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus, the Bible says there in verse number 10, that every knee should bow. Somebody says, I ain't bowing my knee to nobody. One day, one day, one day after a while, and here's my philosophy and it's always been, I'd rather bow my knee to him right now and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And in the future hear him say, well done. Than for me to bow my knee in front of him in the future and him say, depart from me for I never knew you. There's people in this room, there's not but two categories. You'll confess him now or you'll confess him later. And somebody again might be in their bullheaded mindset today and said, I ain't bowing my knee before nobody. Are you God? One of these days, one of these days, my friend, I'd a whole lot rather do it now. I'd a whole lot rather know in my heart right now who Jesus is than to wait for one day after a while. And then we see this in the Word because I'm going to tell you something, friend. Let me finish this verse and I'll tell you. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In heaven or wherever the judgment seat would be, the white throne judgment, the bema seat, whatever the case may be. Who is Lord? The tongue will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. We'll either hear him say, well done, or you'll confess that he is Lord, and then he'll say, depart from me. There's not but too many, two choices to make. And then we see this in the word of the Lord how the Bible says in every tongue confess that Jesus, is, uh, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, when we think about this, I was reading in the book of Revelation. He might have came on a donkey at this time into the city of Jerusalem where all the people were waving the palm branches and they were putting the, all the clothes on the street. They were putting their coats on the street. They were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Yet they, did not, yet they did not get what they expected out of Jesus at that time. And they later in the week called for him to be crucified. So we see this in the word of God of how that the Bible's told us that every knee will bow. Jesus, when we think about it, Revelation 19, and I'll turn there as well in verse number 11. Just a few verses of scripture. And we see this in the word of how that Jesus is coming back again. How many of you believe that? And we can see here in verse number 11 and following where the Bible says here in the word, And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He came on a little humble donkey when he came into Jerusalem. But when he comes again, when he comes again, the Bible said, And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped. This is when the king comes to town, by the way, where the message came from. And he says, or where the title come from, these two places. And it says, and he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And then the Bible says again, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth, see, that army ain't going to fight. How many of you know that? We're just riding with him. We're just riding with him. And it says, and out of his mouth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath, of the Almighty God. And he, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, 
King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, when he came on that occasion, he came in humility. He came there that day. But yet, my friend, when he comes again, he's coming back as a conquering king. He's coming back as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Which Jesus do you know today? Which Jesus do you know today? I'm not serving a weak, kneed, jellyfish, backbone, lip-wristed Jesus, but one who is a conquering king. My friend, we're serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. As they praised Him when He came to Jerusalem, you and I need to praise Him today. Jesus Christ comes not to conquer by force as an earthly king does. But yet the commentary said that Jesus conquers by love, grace, and mercy of His own sacrifice for His people. When we think about it today, Christ's kingdom is not a kingdom of guns and staves as many would want us to think. Not one of splendor, if you will, but one of loneliness and one of servanthood. But yet we see he conquers nations. He conquers hearts. And he conquers man's minds. His message is one of peace with God. Not a temporal peace as they were looking for in the streets of Jerusalem that day. When Jesus made this triumphant entry, that day it was for his crucifixion. Today when Jesus enters into his triumphant entry into our heart, it is because he has been crucified that he enters into your heart today. And my friend, today we serve a triumphant Savior. A triumphant Savior. This week is, again, we think about Holy Week as we go through day by day of the different things that Jesus went through. Tonight, service, we're going to share some things with you. And then we're going to do a communion service tonight in honor of Easter, in honor of this blood that was given. It was given for you. And as often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. This bread that was broken, it is my body that was given for you. We're going to do that tonight. It's going to be a part of the service. Amen. Stand with me. I want you to bow your head with me today for just a minute. When Jesus comes into your life, when Jesus Christ comes into your life, Jesus will change your life. He will take an old black heart filled with sin, wash it in red blood, and make it white as snow. I wonder today if there's anybody in this room that would say, Pastor, I'm tired of living the life I'm living. The Jesus that you talked about today, I need this Jesus. How do I receive this Jesus? How do I get to know this Jesus? The Bible said you have to open up your heart. You have to let him in. You have to want him to come in. It's not religion. It's not a, a seat on a pew in a church, in a building. But it's when you invite Jesus into your heart, you invite him into your life, and you live for him forevermore. You say, how do I do that, Pastor? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. When Paul was there with the Philippian jailer and that whole story in the book of, of Acts chapter number 16. What happened there that day? God sent an earthquake and they were delivered. They were set free. The, day, the jailer was getting ready to take his own life. And Paul with a loud voice said, Hey, do thyself no harm. We're all here. And that man experienced such a wonderful transformation in the presence of God at that time. He said these words, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. 
Maybe today you've never accepted Jesus into your heart. Today's a great day to do that. As you're standing right there in that pew, as you're standing right there at that seat, why don't you just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Lord, I confess I have sinned. I confess I've missed the mark. I confess I need to be born again. He'll save you. If you want to be born again, He'll save you and He'll save you today. Ask Him. Ask Him today. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Lord, I confess with my mouth. I know I've missed the mark. I know I've sinned. I know I've said things and done things that I should not have done. Lord Jesus, today I ask you to forgive me for doing those things and saying those things. And, and Lord, I ask you to come into my heart right now. Lord, look, make me a new creature. Forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my unrighteousness. And God, cleanse me and make me whole. And Lord, I'll follow you. I'll follow you all the days of my life. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. If you made that decision today, would you just lift up your hand, anybody in the room at all? I got a good report today that the rapture took, takes place. Everybody in this building is going. Everybody in this building is right with God today. So I celebrate that. I give God glory for that. I give God praise for that. Go have a good lunch. We'll come back this evening at 4.30 in the choir. Don't tell me you don't get a chance to sing now. 4.30 is your chance and opportunity. And then we'll have church time at 6 o'clock tonight. God bless you as you go in Jesus' name.